Every Monday, each of us selects the cars we are going to drive for the week from those available in the office lot. Some weeks are better than others. There was that time AMG sent us every model it makes, which made every other trip of the calendar feel somewhat underpowered. Most weeks are like that cruel recess scenario played out in schoolyards, where the unpopular kid gets picked last. For the last 15 months, the most affordable, least powerful and most utilitarian long-term car in our fleet has been a 2015 Honda Fit, living a lonely existence. The Fit wasn't routinely ignored because it is a bad car, rather, it was simply the most basic four-wheel transportation on our scheduling board. There were no seat heaters in this Fit, no NAV or satellite radio, minimal seat controls, and also the sense that sound insulation was cut to keep down costs. This is metronomic A to B transportation. Were it not for the superb chassis of the previous two generations of Fit, we would not mourn that this third-gen steering has gone numb, or that the shifter has lost some of its crisp action. This redesigned Fit, however, did maintain its status as a packaging marvel, feeling huge on the inside despite its tidy exterior dimensions, achieved by positioning the fuel tank under the front seats. Fold down the rear seats to reveal a cargo hold seemingly designed by an Air Force C-5 loadmaster. It's rated at 53 cubic feet but feels far more cavernous. Four wheels and tires, a floor jack, and a few fuel cans leave enough room for a cooler of beer. It seems to have more room back there than many three-row SUVs, which coincidentally cost three times as much. We requested an X model because it's the highest spec manual transmission fit these days. With an out-the-door price of $18,225, Honda's cheapest car costs a fraction of what many of our other 40,000 milers do. The fit struggled for attention among a long-term fleet that included a BMW M3, a Chevy Corvette, a Porsche Cayman S, a Subaru WRX, and a Volkswagen GDI. That is, until it was needed to do what it does best move people or things that seem disproportionately large in comparison to the fit's pint size. Six foot three inch technical editor Eric Tingwall was departing for an 1100 mile round trip to upstate New York with three equally tall friends of Scandinavian descent when he found himself confronted with a catch 22 of sorts, having to choose between sufficient physical space, the fit, or a higher level of interstate serenity, pretty much everything else in the lot. He said, I never would have chosen the fit for a drive this long too buzzy and loud, among the other comfort-related shortcomings built into every cheap car. But really, what car in our long-term fleet has more real-world legroom? Not the VW GDI, not the Subaru WRX, not the Mazda 3, and not the BMW M3. He may have returned from the Adirondacks with a distinctive 1.5-liter ring in his ears the Fitz engine spins at 4,000 rpm at 80 mph but at least he and his compatriots weren't stiff-legged. It's the Fitz usability that keeps it competitive in the sub-$20k market. Yes, the car fell off our 10BEST list with this new generation, but that's only because the entertainment factor took a nosedive. Its value and practicality are still fantastic even if we did find little irritants. Exhibit A, the radio volume is controlled via a capacitive touch slider, which occasionally doesn't react as desired. We avoided it, choosing to use the volume buttons on the steering wheel. One editor wondered how the fussy radio interface made it through Honda's approval process when the climate control has a conventional three-knob setup including a manual slider it gives a satisfying thwoosh ho up sound when you move it that switches between fresh air and recirculation. We averaged 34 mpg, topping every gas-powered long-term car of the last 10 years with one exception, the 39 mpg sipping 2010 Honda Insight. With a 10.6-gallon tank, the fit should be good for 350 miles between fuel stops. Alas, but we rarely went that far. Even when cruising on the highway with the consumption leaning out to 37 to 39 mpg, the fit only went more than 350 miles between stops twice in 171 fill UPS. The problem is a warning light that illuminates prematurely and laser beams into your eyes like a doomsday clock impelling you to refill when there are still about 3 gallons of regular in the tank. 
After posting a quick for a fit 16.1 second quarter mile in initial testing, the 130 HP runabout wintered with our West Coast crew in Southern California. On the trip to and fro, our road warriors found little long-haul peace of mind, particularly on the western highways where heavy trucks carve pavement ruts and the fit's narrow stance means it dances between the valleys. The sensation is one of torque steer at 70 miles per hour. It was also on this trip that we dabbled with one of the FIT's few creature comforts, Honda Link smartphone integration. It's intended to mirror select iPhone apps on the radio screen, but we found Honda Link finicky in operation and convoluted in setup. Aside from spending $107 on cables, including HDMI and Apple Lightning wires and an adapter to marry the two, a user must load three applications on a smartphone to make Honda Link work. Worst of all, Honda Link locks out all other smartphone apps. So long, Waze. There is a Honda Spec navigation app, but it runs $60 and we didn't see its value. It is worth mentioning that factory NAV isn't available on the X, and Honda Link is what you have to endure if you must have a manual transmission and in-dash navigation. Apple and Android have since rolled out infotainment software that mirrors your smartphone, and both function better than Honda's beta version.